Good morning. Welcome to Sunday School. Uh, today is March 29th, I think, if I recall correctly. It's getting harder and harder to keep up with what day of the week it is, much less what day of the month it is. But I'm almost certain today's March 29th. Hope you all are doing well out there. Um, I'm excited to see you all looking so good as what you do right now. I do hope that you will watch this and then stick around for Pastor Danny. He'll be preaching live on the church Facebook page, The Church at CW. He'll be doing that at 10 o'clock, along with uh, worship music as well. Um, today, our Sunday School lesson centers on Romans 14 and the first few verses of Romans chapter 15. I think there's some very applicable lessons and messages that we can see um, in this text. So what I want to do uh, is pray, and then we'll get started looking at Romans 14 and 15. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this day you've given to us. Thank you for the opportunity to read your word and the opportunity to teach your word. I ask that you will um, just speak uh, to each person who watches this video and, and Lord, just give them the, the thing to cling on to at the very moment this week when they need it the most. I believe it's here if we listen and open our hearts, clear our minds, God. Uh, just let us hear your voice. Let us be in your presence. God, let us focus in on you and the, the things that um, you have to teach us and show us in this new and crazy world that, that we're living in right now. Um, God, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the salvation that comes by no other name but the name of Jesus. And I just pray today that we will um, all be pointed towards him uh, as we, we do Sunday school and our church service. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 14. Um, we finished last week talking about uh, how to love your neighbor, how to operate underneath the government, how, how you're supposed to submit to governmental authority. We also had a list of kind of what it looks like to be a Christian. And now we go into Romans chapter 14, which is um, by and large going to be some instruction on like how to get along with people that maybe you disagree with. If you had to really title this situation, um, you might stick that title on it. The law of liberty is the way my Bible titles it, but how to get along with people who are different than you, who maybe have a few different things they do, who look different, who have different customs and traditions. The way I understand it, the church at Rome was made up of uh, Jewish people who had converted to Christianity and faith in Jesus Christ, and they still had a large uh, influence from their upbringing and then you also had Gentile people who never had been really like church people before and they also had an influence from their upbringing and Paul was teaching these these two groups how to uh, how to get along so let's look at Romans chapter 14 I'm gonna read verses 1 through 12 to start we'll talk about that and then we'll do 13 through 23 and then we'll move on to chapter 15 uh, Romans 14, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak <clears throat> eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Um, first thing I see here is the word receive. Uh, the way I understand it, the word receive is going to mean welcome. 
So Paul starts off by telling uh, the strong in faith Christian contingent in the church at Rome to welcome those who are weak in faith. Um, the way that, that everybody that, that seems to be teaching this seems to teach it is that um, Paul is kind of discussing to the Gentiles um, to receive in the Jewish uh, converts, and, and he identifies maybe the Gentiles as the stronger in faith and the Jewish people as maybe the weaker in faith. I, I don't think he meant that as an insult, especially considering that he is um, a, a Jewish person. So uh, how do we really resolve that, first of all, without anyone being offended? I think maybe if you were a Gentile and you never had any custom or tradition or law or any inclination that you were one of God's chosen people, you had never done anything and you were saved completely by faith in Jesus Christ, then you would have a big, strong faith. By the same token, if you were from a Jewish family and you had been observing the, the legal traditions and customs and doing the sacrifices and all of the things that, that you had been doing, um, it, it would seem like you at least had in your mind an idea that all of those things used to work before and, and now I'm saved by Jesus Christ. Um, the Gentiles had, had nothing else that they had ever done um, except for faith in Jesus Christ. And the Jewish people were God's chosen people from way on back. I mean, and, and so they, Paul identifies them as a little bit weaker um, in faith. I don't, I don't know if that's a fair assessment or not, but, you know, de definitely there were customs and traditions that, that the Jewish people had been following, and there were not, not the same customs and traditions that the Gentiles had. Really what it, it goes back to your raising, um, and people have all kind of different raisings. It, I, I learned that the things that your parents did to, with, and for you um, carry on into your adult life, and sometimes you, you just can't even dodge it. You, you don't even understand um, why you have certain thought patterns, why you have certain behavior patterns, why you do things you do and won't do things, and a lot of it goes back to your raising. But your raising, um, you know, while it's with you, it, it can be modified and adopted somewhat. I, I have a story, uh, kind of, a, I remember the first time that my wife ever hit me. Um, she wasn't my wife at the time, but there was a time when we first started dating that, that she did hit me. And the reason that she hit me was because um, I, I threw trash out of the window um, on the way on a date we were on it, and immediately I just felt a punch in my right arm um, as she, she smacked me and told me that that was not acceptable. And, you know, I was kind of raised like we kind of did that a little bit. It, at least it wasn't, you know, strictly prohibited. And she was raised in a different way where you keep all of the trash in the car. Um, and I was raised to have a clean, trash-free car. She was raised that you keep the trash in the car. And, you know, that that's something in my raising that, I, I'm not blaming my parents, but I'm not saying I had bad parents, but I mean, at, at the very minimum, we threw cigarette butts out of the car because my parents smoked. So then, you know, sometimes other stuff kind of flew with it too. Um, it goes back to your raising. Now, that that the point is that that didn't mean that we couldn't have fellowship together, my wife and I. Um, and, and ultimately, I have gotten to the point where I don't litter uh, anymore. So it, it was a... That it's, it's a raising type of situation. And I imagine in this church, we had the Gentile people who were talking about how they were raised. And we had the Jewish people who were talking about how they were raised. And the Jewish people were saying, well, we've always done this and this and this. And the Gentile people were saying, well, we've never done anything. I don't understand what y'all are talking about. We just believe that Jesus is all you need. And Paul tells them, don't dispute over doubtful things. Don't dispute over foolish and ignorant things. There's a verse that I love comes from 2 Timothy 2.23, and it says, Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Um, when I was working at the group home with the teenage girls, we had this one on the wall. I memorized it. It became such a mantra around there that even my, my young son, Luke, he would go around saying it as well. Avoid ignorant and foolish disputes, knowing they generate strife. And we said it over and over again. And if I got going down a road that I thought was going to be ignorant or foolish, I would try to stop it right there um, so that I wouldn't generate strife. And that really helped to promote unity. The Bible is full of different 
instances where we are called to be unified people. And it's interesting, the more that, that you look around, the more that you will find out that there's a lot of disunity. And the disunity that you see, especially in the Christian church, um, very often is not about major issues. You have major issues like God created us. That's something that we generally agree on in the church. We have this, um, this, this principle and this truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and that he was God and he was man. He lived a perfect life. He rose again on the third day and there's salvation by no other name. That's the gospel. And that, that's something that churches usually don't um, divide over. Uh, or, or split up over. Those are things that we're unified around. But even being unified in our salvation, it is strange how our personal preferences uh, can, can serve to divide us and, and make us be not unified. Uh, one, one thing that, that might you know, cause friction in a church is, is whether or not um, you're going to have a, a band music or whether or not you should have piano music or whether you should have hymnals whether you should have words only on the screen, or maybe whether you should have both. Should we have pews in the church? We've always had pews in the church. Um, should we have, you know, name it? And that may have been a similar situation what was going on in the church at Rome, especially around these two topics that Paul is going to identify here about what you eat and about um, whether or not we are going to strictly observe the Sabbath. So those are the two things that we're going to get to. But first of all, before we do that, there are many calls to unity throughout the Bible. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13 says this, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but you are perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. It's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. And now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Don't let people divide you up when Christ is the only Savior. He's the only one who was crucified for us, and he was crucified for all of us. And we shouldn't let there be contentions and divisions among us. Um, Galatians 5.15 talks also uh, to this point. It says, if you bite and devour each other, beware lest you be consumed with one another. You ever been just feeling like you're just consumed with someone else? Like you just can't get them out of your mind? It's just so, oh, I'm so angry. I'm so mad. I can't believe they would do that. You think about them all the time. You're just consumed. So don't bite and devour other people. Ephesians 4, 1, 3, 1 through 3 uh, Paul tells us this, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called with lowliness and gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Do you ever feel like you're just bearing with somebody and you're long-suffering? Long-suffering, and you break that down, it means suffering for a long time while you bear with somebody. We're called to do that, to, to be patient and bear with other people, endeavoring to keep unity, unity and bond. And the only two ways, according to Ephesians, that we're going to do that is the unity that we get through the Holy Spirit and the bond that we can have through peace. The way that I see that we can best do that is avoid ignorant and foolish disputes, knowing they generate strife. I like Philippians 4, 1 through 3. In the letter to the church at Philippi, Paul didn't just give a principle. He actually went ahead and named some names. He tells us this, I think it's Philippians 4, 2 and 3. Uh, he says, I implore uh, Eudodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, uh, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers. What Paul is saying right here, and, and it's made it, you know, this was a letter to the church at Philippi where he named these two names of Euodia and Syntyche, and he said, these ladies are fighting, please help them uh, stop fighting, and he names, he asked Clement and other elders in the church to do that. Can you imagine, um, this made it in the Bible, this is the legacy that these two women have, have left, and they, I don't know, maybe it was their grandchildren's children's children, and maybe they knew the, the family tree and the family heritage, and they went back up and said, yeah, you remember great-great-granny Sintek. She's here in the Bible. And look at what she's here for. You remember that fight she was having way back then? And you know how I still don't talk to those people? Because I, I don't know if that's exactly how it broke down, but what a legacy to leave that you're mentioned in the Bible 
getting kind of reprimanded because of a fight that you were having. And Paul took time out of his day and, and in his writing to name names. It, it must have been pretty bad. Um, don't let that be your legacy and your heritage to be remembered for a fight that you had or for a disagreement or grudge that you just couldn't get over. Uh, you, you don't want it to be like that. Psalms 133 says it easy and, and clear. 133.1 of the Psalms. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We see in these uh, verses, we see that there is an eating debate, all right? Um, some people would eat meat, uh, and if you read 1 Corinthians 8, you see maybe that some of the church in Corinth, that certain people the, would, would eat meat that had been offered to idols, and other folks wouldn't eat that meat ever because it was unclean. So we have this debate about what we're supposed to eat or what we're not supposed to eat. And Paul says this, this is verse 3 of chapter 14, let him who eats, uh, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. God welcomes all these folks uh, regardless of whether or not they eat meat. What I wrote on my paper, it says, Paul says, for the eater not to despise the non-eater and the non-eater not to judge the eater. And I say, whew, that's just a whole lot of words. And that's a whole lot of thought processes right here. Um, don't despise somebody because of the liberty that they are exercising. If you have a personal conviction um, that that's wrong, if it's not one of the major uh, things that we discussed about, about Jesus Christ, and if it's not one of the commands or the prohibitions in the Bible, um, you know, don't let that divide you. And at the same time, if you're going to um, exercise that the kind of liberty, uh, you, you shouldn't look down on other people for not being as strong as, as you are in your liberty. That That's really the, the essence of the debate right here. The Jewish people had uh, clean and unclean animals that they ate in the Old Testament. And you see in Acts chapter 10, where Peter, I think, was up on the rooftop, and he sees a vision, and in this vision, all of these animals are, are kind of coming down. Uh, Acts 10, 9 through 16, the next day they went up on a journey and drew near the city. Peter went up on a housetop to pray in the sixth hour. He became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and heaven opened up, object like a great sheet bound with four corners descended down to him. I'm picturing the stork dropping something. Um, in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth and beasts and creeping things and birds of the air. Dinner time. A voice came to him and said, Peter, rise, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord. I'm never eating anything common or unclean. And the voice spoke a second time and said, what God has cleansed you shall not call common. This happened three times and then the object was taken back up. Not long after that, um, so, so God tells Peter, uh, Jewish apostle that, you know, what God has cleansed you shall, shall not make unclean. So that means you can eat these things. Not much, not, not a long time after that, Peter had the opportunity, I think, to um, witness to some Gentiles. And then he, he went and ate with the Gentiles in Acts 11. So, you know, God, God kind of said that it's okay for, for you to eat with Gentile people and for you to eat animals, things of that nature. Peter did it for a while, but then you see later on um, in Galatians where Paul calls him out because Peter had, had been eating with Gentiles, but then the Jewish people showed up. And I don't know exactly why. I don't know if he was worried what they would think about him. It's probably what it was. But he didn't eat with the Gentiles when the Jewish people were there. And in Galatians 2, 11 through 13, I really like this. Paul, um, he, he applies Matthew 18, 15, I believe. I don't know if he... Um, I don't know if he does it gently. I think he probably does it from a spirit of love. It's, it's interesting verses, though. Paul says, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. I got in his face about it. For certain men came from James, and he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas, the encourager, I guess is who that means, was carried away with their hypocrisy. So Peter um, screwed it up, and he, he showed, you know, kind of a little bit of partiality or 
cliquishness and that he, he would eat with the Jewish people or he would eat with the Gentile people and then some other folks uh, from James came up and then he, he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles uh, anymore after that. Paul said, I got in his face about it. I told him what I thought about it. Um, the Bible tells us this. Uh, who, who are you to judge another's servant? Who are you to judge another's servant? The idea here is that we're all servants of God and that people make decisions about how they're going to serve God. And who are we to judge someone else's servant on how they're serving the master? If you get into where you want to judge a servant of someone else, you are trying to maybe um, insert yourself as master. Success as a Christian doesn't depend on, on other people's attitudes or opinions about you. You're supposed to seek to please God. It's very, very hard because let's be honest, we all care at least on some level what some other people, if not many, if not all, think about us. It's just kind of the way we are as humans, but we're supposed to seek to please God and we're not supposed to serve other people who may try to insert themselves as our master and we're not supposed to try to serve or we're not supposed to try to be the master of other people. And man, I struggle with this. Uh, day in, day out. I mean, it, it, you know, who am I trying to, to impress or who am I worried about if I'm offended or who am I trying to, on some level, maybe control? It's, it's not good stuff. Um, it sums up like this, let the Lord God be Lord of your life and everybody else's. I'm going to say that again. Let God be the Lord of your life and everybody else's. There's only one Lord. Um, keep yourself busy working for the Lord, and then you'll have probably less time to condemn others. So just busy yourself working for the Lord. Try to get praise from only one, um, from only God, doing the things he tells us to do in the Bible. Don't, don't try to be master over somebody else. Um, one person esteems one day above another, and another person esteem, esteems every day alike. Um, this is the, the best part of the lesson to me, I think, because I think this is where we really can find a little bit of relevance um, here today in, in this world that we're living in. This is about Sabbaths and the feast. Um, as far as I understand, the Jewish people uh, observed the Sabbath, and they did it from, I think, I think it was sundown, maybe on Friday until sundown on Saturday night, um, the seventh day of the week. The reason that they observed the seventh day of the week um, is because in Genesis 2, 3, we see that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, and because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made. Came on when Moses was getting the Ten Commandments. We have remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, no work nor shall your son or daughter or your cattle or anybody do any work. In six days God made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Deuteronomy echoes that. Um, and then Isaiah, has, has Isaiah 58, 13 through 14, that has a kind of a little thing about what, what happens if you do honor the Sabbath. You'll delight yourself in the Lord, and he will cause you to ride on high hills of the earth. Um, Jesus came and, and put forth, he, he did some things on the Sabbath. One, one thing that happened, he and his disciples plucked heads of grain off a field um, and rubbed them with their hands on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees got on to him about it. And Jesus reminded them about when David ate showbread that had been consecrated way back in 1 Samuel chapter 21, I believe is where that story is. Um, and he, he tells them this, the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. And then if you look at Luke chapter 6, it also happens where a man uh, comes in and he's got a withered right hand. The Pharisees are all watching to see what Jesus is going to do. Um, and Jesus knows their thoughts and he, he asks if it's lawful on the Sabbath. This is Luke 6, 9. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or evil or to save life or destroy? And he looked around and told the man to stretch out his hand. The man stretched out his hand and he was healed. Many other, a couple of other examples where, you know, Jesus asked the, the Pharisees in Matthew 12, 9 through 13, uh, if, if a sheep were to fall into a pit on the Sabbath, would you get a hold of it and take it out? And I think this is the same story maybe with the man with his right hand, the withered hand. So he asked them that. If, you, if your animal fell into a pit on the Sabbath, would you pull it out? So here's a, a man who's come to me for healing, 
and I'm going to heal him. Um, Jesus says in Mark 2, 27, that uh, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Um, Paul says one person esteems one day above another, and another person esteems every day alike. Let each uh, be convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day does not observe it to the Lord. Um, Jesus tells us that the Sabbath is made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And there are still people who are good Christian people who observe uh, the Sabbath on the seventh day. Many of the, the Protestant churches that we have now, though, observe Sunday as the Lord's Day. Uh, that comes from Acts 27, at, at where the disciples came together to break bread on the first day. Probably all started Jesus rose from the grave on the first day of the week. Um, John 21, chapter 20, verse 1 speaks to that. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, we see an instruction to lay something aside on the first day of the week. seems that that's when the church started meeting, and we've kind of carried that through. Revelation 1, 10, John talking about Patmos. He says it was on the Lord's Day, um, I think when he had the visions uh, that became the book of Revelation. The Lord's Day is commonly referred to as the first day of the week which is Sunday. So I guess in the church at Rome, we had this idea of are we going to observe the Sabbath? And what Sabbath means is rest. Um, and, and God rested on the seventh day. There's no argument about that. I don't um, know that maybe he, he, I don't know if God needs rest. I can't really rationalize that. But I, I believe this. I believe that God wants people to have rest. I think he gave people the Sabbath for us to have rest. And I don't think that the, the New Testament says that it has to be one particular day, but I do believe that we are supposed to have rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight tells us to come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Psalms forty six ten says, be still and know that I am God. We're not supposed to work all the time. No matter where you land on the on the Sabbath or the Lord's Day or all days are the Lord's Day. Um, we're created in the image of God, and, and God gave us this example in that he rested. And to me, that means that we probably should too. Uh, I put on the paper a, a rest test. You know, if you were given the opportunity to work 365 days uh, from now until March the 29th of next year, you work 10 hours every day and you were to um, make 10 times the money you make now with no days off, uh, would that be something you would be willing to do? I don't know. What about 100 times? You know, what's your number? Is there a number where you would say, yes, for a whole year I would not rest? I don't, I don't know. Um, but, but not resting is, is not good. Yet it seems like in America we, we have this no rest principle that we kind of, put a badge of honor on somebody if they don't rest. Have you ever heard somebody say, man, this guy never slows down. He's always going and going and going and going. Or you, you hear sometimes, I, you hear about the, the older guys, man, he could outwork all of us um, longer and, and harder than any of the rest of us. I'm not saying that hard work is bad, but sometimes you're supposed to rest. And right now what, what we see, especially as I watch news about the city that never sleeps, and about their streets that are empty. Um, we're in a time of rest right here in our country. Um, and, and really, you know, what, do, we have, what, what, do we have days that, that we set aside completely for rest? Or are we willing to go chase dollars in our rest time? Do we even have a half a day that we set aside completely for rest? If you are... Uh, honoring God on the first day of the week, is that the Lord's day? Or do we give God a couple hours on Sunday morning and then move on to the rest of what we want to do? Very often things that, that don't involve rest. I know uh, I, I have a friend and she works, I think, overnights on, on the weekends and Monday, she's told me, doesn't exist. It's not even a day. That's her day of rest. Like, don't call me on Monday. I don't do anything on Monday. And she just rests on Monday. I think maybe that we all need to have a time when we say, yes, this is my time. It's designated rest. 
Um, I, I wonder if God's given us a little bit of rest right now because, you know, you can't go out and do anything. Um, maybe he is. I, I, that's kind of been on my heart um, that, that we do need rest, and I believe this church needed rest. And certainly what you don't need to do and is fight about whether or not you're going to rest on a particular day or whether you're going to have, you know, other designated times of rest. You just need to do it. Man, I, I hate rest, though. I remember um, as, a, as a kid, my grandmother, a saintly lady, she was in her 70s, and she would take us to the swimming pool in Pleasant Grove, Alabama. We would drive over, and it seemed like we always got there at like 12 minutes to the hour. And on the 50s, they had the rest break where you had to get out for 10 minutes. So we would jump in the pool for two minutes, and then you had to rest for 10. And I'm like, man, I just got here. And we all, all the kids knew to watch the clock and all this. But the last 10 minutes, you had to rest. Does the pool know something? Are they applying something to our life, to, to their policies that maybe we need to be applying to our lives about rest? Um, so don't fight about the Sabbath. Whatever you do, whether you observe it or, or not, do it unto the Lord. Um, and God has given us this rest. Let's take that not for granted in our lives. The next thing that we see, um, the Bible say, is that we're supposed to follow our personal convictions. Um, verse 6, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats to the Lord and he who gives thanks and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and give thanks. None of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. In the end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the living and the dead. Um, so whatever you do, you're supposed to do to the Lord. You're supposed to be fully convinced in your own mind um, that what you're doing, you're doing to the Lord. And you're supposed to give God thanks in, in all that you do, whether you're going to eat meat or whether you're not, or whether you're going to um, observe the seventh day Sabbath, or whether you're not, you're supposed to do it all to the Lord, and you're not supposed to judge and show contempt. We get down into, let's see, verses 10, I think it is. Why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So there's a day coming where we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is the Bema judgment seat that you hear about, and we're going to be called on to give an account for our life, and you know, the account for our life is going to have to deal with our, our crowns that we're going to be getting. This isn't the salvation. Uh, this, this isn't the, the great white throne judgment that, that you read about where there's going to be a separation. This is the judgment seat of Christ. We should be getting ready um, to stand before Christ and, and give the account for what we've done. And we don't need to be really worried too much about what other people are doing. Uh, we need to be worried about what we're doing for the Lord. And, man, it's... It's hard. It's been hard. It, and there's an example in the Bible that really shows even exactly how hard it is. We see this interaction where Peter in John 21 is talking to Jesus. And Peter is getting restored to fellowship after he has denied Jesus three times and after Jesus has died and risen again. He comes and he asks Peter three, time, three questions, basically, um, do you love me? And Peter says three times, yes, I, I love you. And so Jesus has restored Peter to fellowship. And then Jesus tells Peter this in verse, uh, let's see, I can't tell exactly. I think it's verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Um, and he's, he, he tells Peter that saying, you're going to be crucified one day. That's the job I have for you. That, that's part of the process and part of the program that I have for you. Jesus is telling Peter he's going to be crucified, and he tells him to follow me. And so Peter knows what Jesus wants him to do. He has Jesus there with him, and he, he does what we all do when we're given maybe a task that seems kind of tough. He looks over to John and says, well, what about this guy? Right? And isn't that exactly how we are? You know, what about everybody else? We're supposed to focus on ourselves. Um, we're supposed to focus on, on reaching the lost people for Christ. And we're supposed to focus on edifying, building other people up. And when God's given us something to do, 
as Jesus tells Peter right here, uh, Jesus says, uh, essentially, you know, what is it to you? Verse 22, Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is it to you? You follow me. Um, and then Jesus said this and went out. Uh, that, that's a tough thing that, that we are fighting against, to look at other people and say, well, what about them? Well, what about them? Why can't it be like that? You know, but God has given me my race to run, and I, I get in the most trouble when I go and, and try to say that I want to run somebody else's race because I'm not equipped to run anybody else's race. And I look at other people's races and, and chores and tasks that they're given, and I say, man, that would be a nice chore. But I don't understand their burdens, and I don't understand the, the things that they have to, to deal with every day. Um, and really, we all just need to focus on the thing that God has given us to do to prepare ourselves um, for that day when we stand before Christ and give an account of our actions, as Romans tells us in 14, 12, each shall give an account of himself to God. You don't have to give account to anybody else. Um, give an account of yourself. Therefore, let us judge, not judge one another anymore, but resolve this. Don't be a stumbling block or cause to fall. Don't put a stumbling block or cause to fall in your brother's way. You can cause people to fall and very often the way that you do it, I think, is, is through judging them by the things that they're doing. Romans 14, uh, 14 through 23, that's the law of liberty, okay? And now we move on to the law of love. Here we go. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify one another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith or for whatever is not from faith is sin. Point here is this. Um, you affect others and the things you do matter um you you have influence over other people whether you know it or not sometimes a, a principle here knowledge puffs up but love builds up like you you may have a ton of knowledge uh about you know christianity and and the things of the bible and you can use that knowledge to hurt people if you aren't careful um and and i'm again not very good at, at knowing when to temper things down. If, if it's true, I'm going to say it. And I, I've kind of run a lot of people maybe off by doing stuff like that. So I, I try to understand that you've got to mix knowledge with love. You can't just be brutal with the knowledge that you have, especially um, with younger and, and more immature Christians uh, and, and maybe sometimes even with older, uh, more mature Christians. You, you want to make sure that, that you love. First, the, the example that I have um, is if you have a child and they're 100% convinced that there is a monster in the closet, you certainly know that there's not a monster in the closet, and you can tell them and tell them and tell them, and you can rip the closet open and show them there's not a monster in the closet, and you can just say, I just can't see why you don't get through your thick skull that there's not a monster in the closet, kid. And that's not helping the kid go to sleep. Um, you have to have knowledge of what is real and what isn't about the monster, but you also need to mix that in with a loving knowledge of what the child needs. And what he really needs is for you to sit there, console him, um, maybe pat his head, rub his hair, so that you, you know that uh, you know the monster doesn't exist, but you, you stay there until your child falls asleep uh, rather than just being brutal with the knowledge that you have. You mix that in with love. We're supposed to be doing that with our Christian brothers and sisters as well. We're supposed to be comforting, consoling, 
uh, understanding above all else we we love um, what we do matters I'm convinced by the Lord that there is nothing unclean of itself but to him who considers anything unclean to him it is unclean uh, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food you're no longer walking in love don't you know, if, if you consider it unclean, to you it is unclean. But if somebody else is grieved because of what you're doing, you're not walking in love if you just flaunt and say, yes, this is the way, the way we're going to do it. Um, don't destroy somebody who Christ died because of your food, um, because of the choices that you make about what you can do with your Christian liberty. Don't use that to the destruction um, of others. It's not just about you. Um, also, don't destroy... Other people with your judgments, if, if you have different preferences or different understandings or different convictions, um, you're not supposed to destroy them with that either. Uh, this verse, verse 16, says, Do not let your good be spoken of as evil. So in trying to do good in your own life and in trying to you know, follow the things that God has told you to do and, and adhering to the convictions that you have with Him, don't let that be spoken of as evil by other people. Um, so while, while you're not supposed to be a judge, you are supposed to be cognizant that, that other people are watching and what you do matters. At the same time, um, I think the, the most badly spoken of thing that many Christians do is judging other people, maybe in the guise that we're trying to help them. Um, so it... Keep in mind that, that if you are passing judgment, especially on, on things that are your personal convictions that other people may not share, um, that also could be spoken of as evil and could cause people to be run off and run away um, from the church. But it is not just about you. The kingdom of God is, is more about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We need to focus on righteousness and peace joy and love, eternal things, spiritual priorities. Um, focus on those things in your own life. Focus on trying to fill other people's lives up with those um, to help them grow. It says in, in Romans that we're supposed to pursue things um, that make peace. Pursue things that make peace. And peace to me is a little bit the opposite of strife. So we go all the way back to 2 Timothy 2.23, avoid ignorant foolish disputes, knowing they generate strife. Let's find some common ground. Let's don't look for all the differences that we have. And the common ground centers around righteousness, love, and peace, and joy. These are the ways that we're going to be able to grow together as Christian people, um, not focusing on the fights that we could have because it's easy to fight, and it's easy to find a way to fight with anybody, um, especially about differing opinions. Um, but if you focus on the eternal things and you focus on spiritual priorities this is acceptable to both men and to god and a list of things that probably help promote peace we talked about last week or in romans 12 9 through 21 you can go back and reread over that list um 12 18 says if it is possible as much as depends on you live peaceably with all men so we have some ideas there um, about how, how to try to work for peace you're not supposed to do anything that makes your brother stumble um, or makes him weak or offends him. Uh, older Christians are supposed to be trying to help younger Christians grow. And when you think about when you first bring a baby home uh, into the house, like you can't do things like you used to do them before because the baby is going to do things that could hurt themselves, but, but you, because of your knowledge, um, elect to have certain restrictions and boundaries out of the love that you have for this this baby. And then as the child grows and grows and grows, um, hopefully they get uh, more and more knowledge and understand more like you do, and they know not to harm themselves. Church is kind of supposed to be the same way, where the older Christians, even though they do have um, liberty through Jesus Christ, are supposed to understand that younger and more immature Christians um, need to see certain boundaries in place uh, so, so that they don't hurt themselves uh, with the liberty that we have. That's kind of the law of love. I'll give up things that I could do because I love the, the people that are here with me. 
the same way you do when you bring uh, your kids home and, and you have to put plugs in the outlets and you have to you know, make sure that the stairs are blocked and you have to make sure that you can't have them pull over the chest of drawers and all these kind of things you have to do when you have little children to protect them and keep them safe because you love them. Um, same way with mature Christians. Let's protect and keep the, the other folks safe because we love them, the, the younger and less mature Christians. The problems arise sometimes, though, when you have a 30- or 40-year-old Christian who's just continuing to act like a 2-year-old, uh, like I do sometimes, and like probably if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us do, because we just get fed up or we just get jealous or we just get mad or we just have to tell somebody about something or we have to judge this person. We can't believe they did it. Um, that's not the example that the more mature Christians should be setting for the younger Christians. Um, we're supposed to try to live in peace and we're supposed to try to be edifying each other and helping us, helping each other grow, pursue the things that make for peace. Um, don't force your opinions on other people. Um, have it to yourself before God is what the Bible tells us in verse 21. Uh, it says, It is neither good to eat nor drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. Um, if you want to be happy, then don't do things that give you a guilty conscience. Um, but you have to also keep in mind that, that your conscience is, is maybe not somebody else's conscience. So have it to yourself before God. Don't condemn yourself and have a guilty conscience by what you approve. Um, if you have doubt uh, about what you're doing, then you probably should be doing it. It says here, verse 20. Two, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith uh, is sin. So whatever you do, do it from your position of faith, keeping in mind of this law of love that we have right here. And I wrote out this. It has three stars by it. It says, certain truths must be uniform among Christians. God is creator, Jesus is God and man. Jesus died on the cross and rose again for our sins. Salvation is through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. Nothing else is required and there is no other way to salvation. Um, about if, if we, we, Our goal should be to spread that word and to constantly be focused on that and, and draw other people in to, to Jesus and not disputing over what kind of chairs we're going to have or what kind of, where the money's, you know, the, the mission trip. There, there's a, many things you can fight about. Um, there are many differences that you can have, many different convictions that you can have. But the heart of the day is that we want to draw people in to this knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. Don't let preferences and customs and traditions uh, divide that. Keep it to yourself before God is what the Bible tells us. Verse 15, or chapter 15, we who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, for his good leading and edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Um, this says we're supposed to be trying to please uh, other people. That doesn't mean to let them be your master. All right, I, I said that that's not worship what we're supposed to do, but God wants us to, to show our love to other people. Uh, let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading and edification. So we're supposed to be trying to pick people up, help them carry their burdens with them. A place uh, that you see that Galatians 6, 2, Philippians 2, 4, and over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you see where we're supposed to try to please uh, 
other people. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ is what Galatians 6, 2 says. Philippians 2, 4 says, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And then in 1 Corinthians 9 is where Paul says that he's trying to become all things to all people so that he may save some. Constantly be focused on how, how can my life be used to save others. Um, so how can you help people pick up and carry their burdens. One thing that came to my mind first is maybe like a negative example of how you can do this. Um, the old A&E show, Intervention. Didn't you just love Intervention, where the whole family sits down and they have this intervention and tell the person all that's going to happen if they don't. Usually I think it was get off of drugs. Um, when that show came out, what I would hear about people at least discussing among themselves whether or not they were going to have an intervention with, you know, whoever, that whatever family member. So the show intervention created like gossip groups about whether or not we ought to have an intervention because of this and this and this and this. And, you know, that the biblical model, if someone's offending you, you're supposed to go to them by yourself. Matthew 18, 15, it's very hard to do. It's much easier to get together a big mob of folks and go, you know, stage this intervention. And I don't think that is what the Bible means when it says to help other people carry their burdens. Um, what I kind of, maybe a few things I think that it does mean is that you create a relationship and when given the opportunity, you tell your story uh, to help lift people up, to help edify them through, you know, I used to do this and then Jesus and now I'm like this. So this happened to me and I got closer to God through it and now here I am. You tell your story. You don't tell them necessarily what they need to do. You just try to inspire through the things that God has done in your life. Another thing um, that you do maybe sometimes when you're helping people bear their burdens, and this is very hard for me, um, is just to shut up. Um, some people just need to talk and talk through things, and you know maybe they just want you to listen. And it's listening is hard, isn't it? You know the old saying that you have two ears and only one mouth, but man, that's just tough. Because if I'm going to listen, then I have to be quiet. And being quiet is not something that, that I do a lot. But sometimes we just need to shut up to help people bear their burdens. We can offer help. Um, you know, you you probably want to listen some before you just offer help. But you you can offer help. You don't want to make sure, you want to make sure that your help is actually helpful. Okay. You don't want to go and and break things further by help that maybe you shouldn't be offering because there's certain help that only is going to come from from God. And don't don't break yourself trying to help somebody and when God is the one who should be helping them. Another thing you could do is just serve them. You know, don't offer help, but just say, I'm, I'm going to give you this. Here, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. So those, those are ways that maybe we can help people um, carry their burdens. It's not about pleasing yourself. The Bible tells us that Christ didn't please himself, uh, but he took the reproaches. That's insults and slanders of God. He took them on, on, his, uh, on, his, on himself, on the cross. So don't be focused on pleasing yourself, but you're supposed to, you know, try to help others, as it says in Philippians uh, 2.4. Another thing that, that we see here is that the purpose of the Old Testament is for learning and patience and comfort to help create hope. If you're wondering uh, what the things that were written before are for, it says it here in verse 4 of chapter 15. It's for learning and patience and to create hope and comfort. Um, and then we have the conclusion. The conclusion really ties it all the way back in to chapter 14, verse 1. Uh, I'm going to read it again. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant to you to be like-minded toward one another according to Jesus Christ, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another uh, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. It's a call to unity um, is what it is right here. May God let you be like-minded toward one another according to Jesus so that you can glorify God um, with one mind and one mouth. When Jesus uh, was on the way to be crucified, he prayed for us. We're the people that would hear the word and believe because of it. And in John 17, 20 through 23, he says, I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us, that they may be one. That was his prayer for us, the modern-day church who would hear 
and believe through the word of the apostles. He, he wanted us to be one. He knew that there would be divisions and that the devil would use divisions to, to tear his church, his bride apart, to tear people um, down, to keep people in doubt, to run people away. And so he prayed for us to be one, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us. The only way that you're going to achieve oneness with a Christian body is through a, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, if you if you don't have that, then you're not going to understand these principles of unity because you're separated from God. Sin separates you from God, and the only way that you can have the relationship with God um, and the right relationship with other Christians is to accept that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again so that you can be forgiven. Um, Jesus goes on and says that the reason he wants us to be one is that the world may believe that you sent me. Um, being one with your Christian brothers has the effect of drawing in the world to believing that Jesus was sent by God. Um, so if, if you had disunity and discord among yourselves in your church, then you're inhibiting, it's, it would seem, uh, people from maybe believing that God really sent Jesus. And that's easy to see. You know, there, there are people, I'm sure, in the world who say, well, if that's what church is like, I'm not going to be part of church. Well, if that's what a Christian's like, I don't, I don't need that. You don't want to be that. Don't, don't be like a, a Christian who pushes people away. Verse 23, Jesus says, uh, I and them and you and me that they may be made perfect in one that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So the reason that we're supposed to strive for unity, the reason that we're supposed to avoid ignorant, foolish disputes, knowing they generate strife, the reason we're supposed to focus on not um, pleasing ourselves but pleasing others and not causing others to stumble is so that we can be one um, in this liberty that we have with this love that we have so that we can draw more people in to, to know Jesus and so that we can work together towards achieving perfection, the Bible tells us, um, in the unity that we have. An easy way to think about it is, you know, um, if, if you're mad at somebody right now or if somebody that you just, just can't get along with, I mean, they're going to be in heaven if they're your Christian brother. Um, and if they're not, then if, if you should want them to come and be a part of of the brotherhood through Jesus Christ. He died for all sinners. And if, if there's somebody that, that you, you know, so think you're better than so much and, and you wouldn't want to see them in heaven, pray for repentance. Pray for repentance on that. Um, so we're supposed to welcome one another just as God, just as Christ has welcomed and received us. And how did he receive us? He received us just as we were. Um, even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So these lessons here are, supposed, are, are telling you how to get along with one another in your church, Christian brothers. Um, don't fight over minor things. If there are major things that come up, if, if somebody's trying to say there's another way to, to salvation than Jesus Christ, that's something you have to, to really, that you, you got to dispel that. If somebody says God isn't the creator or, or different things like that, those are things that are, are deal breakers. Um, those are the majors. And don't fight so much about the minors um, that you create disunity when really you, you agree on the majors. And, and don't make a minor fight take such a precedence in your life that if a false teacher or something comes in who's trying to tell you something that's different than what the Bible says about the major foundational issues of the Christian faith, don't be so consumed with little small fights that you don't have time to attack and, and pay attention to that. So Romans 14 through 15, 7, that's your Sunday school lesson. Don't forget to uh, tune in for Pastor Danny at 10 o'clock. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson you've given to us. And I ask that you will bless all those who are watching this. And God, I, I know I stumbled and kind of mumbled my way through a lot of it. But Lord, I just pray that you will use these teachings to 
convict hearts about being unified um, in your name, seeking peace, not fighting over insignificant things, God, um, but just focusing on the, the unity and commonality that we have and that we were all sinners and we all um, Christians have received Jesus Christ as Savior and, and that Jesus is available for anyone who will believe. Help us focus on that so we may draw more people uh, in to belief through our unity. And help us, God, to, to not push people away through um, causing stumbling blocks and being judgmental and then over insignificant things. Father, I, I ask that you will uh, bless our week that we have, bless the service that's coming um, this morning from Pastor Daniel. In Jesus' name I pray.